Good morning, everyone. It's like we're in class again. Uh, I appreciate everyone switching over to the 16th floor. Uh, my name is Paul Vallone, proud to be chair of this committee, so welcome this morning. We are going to start, we're going to start our hearing, and today we're going to focus on, well, today is really an extension of what we spoke about about a year ago. And, and I want to thank everyone for being such great partners on having our first hearing on tourism, where we went off site to the TWA's new lounge in One World Trade. Uh, that was exciting. And I, I always like to see the different aspects of the industry. And by moving the committee to do that, we were able to have a different experience and we were able to bring the council members uh, into the heart of some of these issues we're going to talk about today. And as promised, we're going to hold annual hearings specifically on the tourism industry and give a chance for our partners at New York and Company with Fred Dixon to give us the, like, an annual report of where we are today in comparison to years past and what our vision is for the future and how we can assist and make that process for all related partners of the tourism, tourism industry better. And that's what today's hearing is about. And what the bill is about is about creating an office which can help co coordinate that interagency coordination between any city agency that impacts the tourism industry. It's really one of the number one concerns that's been brought to us. So whether you're dealing with a new bike lane or a pedestrian plaza or a DOT project or a building permit that hasn't been issued or a runaway construction project that's taken out two lanes on 42nd Street or Astoria Boulevard that now traffic can't get past or any project even from Verizon or Con Edison that somehow impacts the industry relating to tourism, there is not that mechanism in place that can coordinate all that now. So my vision in creating this office of this interagency coordination would be to assist the tourists, the tourism industry and all of its affiliates when a problem or before, even better, the problem arises so that we can have a clear informational path on who to contact, what to do, what the resolution will be and what the plan going forward is. And I think that's my not reading a script telling you off the heart what today's all about. Uh, and that all happened uh, from the, from really the first hearings that we've had, and I'm, I'm proud to do that. So thank you to our staff and the council members. I'll give you a quick little, some of the facts that we have. So in 1998, around 33 million people came to visit New York City. And by 2018, that number's nearly doubled to 65.1 million people. So just in 20 years, the city has witnessed an astounding near 100% increase in the number of visitors. The massive influx of tourists is a testament to the lore of the city's abundance of attractions, uh, iconic skyscrapers, Broadway shows, museums, galleries, restaurants, and other cultural institutions. Much of the city's data in these areas is collected by New York City and Company, whose mission is to promote New York's travel and tourism opportunities not only here but around the entire world. The tremendous work being done by New York City and Company uh, towards promoting the city's tourist economy is clearly evident by the success in the industry we enjoy today. We believe more can be done by the administration to streamline and standardize the tourist experience here in the city once our tourists rely, arrive. And this is uh, what I had summarized. So more importantly, coordinate that interagency communication and involvement on any project that can impact the tourism agency and our tourists, whether it's the creation of a bike lane, pedestrian plaza, department of buildings, Verizon Con Ed projects, park departments, quality of life issues, public safety, or any related project. There is simply more we can do. The business and tourists alike have asked for the office to be created to oversee and coordinate these concerns instead of simply calling 311. While the committee recognizes the importance of tourism dollars to the city economy, it seems the administration takes a different approach. And Mayor de Blasio's New York work plans to create 100,000 jobs across five sectors in 10 years. Tourism is not even listed as a sector of the city's economy, and jobs in tourism are not counted as distinct from other industries. The administration argues that the food services and hospitality sectors account for many tourist-facing jobs, but jobs could just as easily cater to city residents. For these reasons, and the ones we've discussed before, I've introduced legislation before the committee, Intro 1774, which would establish the Office of Interagency Tourism Affairs, which would receive public comments related to tourism and facilitate communication between city agencies on tourism-related industries. Since most city agencies are usually busy conducting their primary responsibilities, tourism-related business and concerns are often lost in the shuffle. We believe the creation of this office will simplify and standardize everyday long-term concerns that face us here in the city. 
We hope today's discussion will provide us with an opportunity to hear the administration's plans to address these ongoing structural and standardization concerns regarding the tourism industry and what, if anything, can be done to assist the city in making it more accessible and enjoyable for everyone, including our tourists. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the many tourism industry advocates who have offered their support all year long in using tourism as a driver of economic development. We would not be having this hearing if not for your commitment to sustainable job creation and tourism and clearly your passion for what you do in the centers. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge we, we have Peter Koo, who actually beat me here today. Peter, are you making me look bad coming from Queens? Uh, Keith Powers, uh, who else is snuck in at the end? Um, Ah, and Councilmember Lewis. I'd like to thank the economic development staff, uh, Alex Polinoff, policy analyst Emily Forgione, and finance analyst Aliyah Ali for their hard work putting this hearing together. I'd like to take the turn the floor over to Fred Dixon, the president and CEO of New York City and Company. Um, give a minute to get situated at the over there. And you know it's probably good idea to have Sabrina from New York City EDC to show up and kind of support since it is EDC that's the overseer of all this. Uh, we'll both have you on the panel and I'd ask you both to raise your right hand so you can affirm for us today that you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth and answer council members' questions honestly and to the best of your ability. I do. All right. So if you could state your name and Fred, if you'd like to start us off. Thank you, council, council member. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, Chairman Vallone and the members of the Committee on Economic Development, my name is Fred Dixon. I'm the President and CEO of NYC and Company. Thank you for this opportunity to share the current state of the travel and tourism industry for New York City and provide some additional insight into our organizational operations. As you know, NYC and Company is the official destination marketing and management organization for the five boroughs of New York City. We are also known oftentimes as the Convention and Visitors Bureau. And our mission is to maximize travel and tourism opportunities throughout the city, build economic prosperity, and spread the dynamic image of New York City around the world. We are a 501c6 private not-for-profit member organization and represent the interests of nearly 2,000 member organizations from across the five boroughs. We are governed by an 85-member board of directors, from which represent a diverse range of businesses from across the city. Our members range from hotels and attractions to bids and chambers of commerce. Together, they fund about half of our operations. We also hold a procurement contract with the Department of Small Business Services to provide the City of New York with certain tourism marketing services. As a destination marketing and management organization, we use our in-house resources, our global network of representatives, and work in tandem with elected officials to drive both leisure and business travelers to the five boroughs. Tourism, by its very definition, is an export industry. As we work to bring new dollars into the market from outside, which are exchanged locally for goods and services. We compete regionally, domestically, and internationally for visitors and their spending. Marketing New York City is our primary function, and we believe we excel at it. To generate inspiration to visit New York City, we create, curate, and promote content on dozens of neighborhoods across the five boroughs in conjunction with robust tourism campaigns to draw visitation year-round. We also recruit meetings, conferences, conventions, trade shows, and big events as part of our global outreach. We work with journalists and media to tell the authentic stories of New York City as an unparalleled, multicultural, and vibrant world-class destination. Our neighborhood small businesses and cultural organizations are essential to the New York City experience. To make sure these neighborhood gems are, pre are prepared to host, engage, and benefit from the growing number of visitors who are exploring widely, we uh, committed ourselves to provide a training and assistance to businesses of all sizes through our Tourism Ready program, which is free and now in its fourth year. More than 500 companies have participated in this program, and it is just one example of how we keep tourism a robust five-borough engine for our economy. And in fact, travel and tourism in New York City is performing at record levels. New York City is the most popular big city destination in the United States and at the top and is the top international destination by a large margin as well. With 65 million visitors last year, volume grew 3.6% and on average New York City welcomed an estimated 180,000 new visitors every day. Direct visitor spending is the key to this growth and last year saw 46 $0.4 billion spent across the five boroughs, an increase of $2.2 billion over prior year. 
The full annual impact of this industry is a $69.8 billion economic engine when you consider both direct and indirect spending, supporting the jobs of 396,000 people who collectively earn almost $27.7 billion a year. That's an average wage of $70,000 across all sectors. Over the past 10 years, this industry has been one of the fastest growing across the city's labor force, adding 5,000 new positions in 2018 alone and making it the seventh largest employment sector in the city. We are on track to exceed these numbers in 2019. What these statistics show is that the New York City tourism industry continues to boom even during these uncertain times. As the leading expert of travel and tourism, we work closely with city government to provide research and insights on the trends and policies affecting these sectors. Visitors near and far rely on our official guidebooks, official tourism website, and member partners to inform their visit to the city. We are proud to be that resource to visitors and government partners. Even though we are not a city agency, our work requires close public-private cooperation to achieve success. We achieve that through a number of ways. First, we have a close working relationship with the Deputy Mayor of Housing and Economic Development, and her senior advisor works regularly with our administrative team so we can flag any issues and immediate concerns. We have a standing monthly check-in meeting with the Deputy Mayor and regularly attend her monthly commissioner luncheons. As a board member, the Deputy Mayor receives all board correspondence, of course, and has access to our reports. As a member organization, our nearly 2,000 members inform us regularly of any issues they face across the five boroughs that may be impacting their businesses. During my monthly check-ins with the Deputy Mayor, I update her on any of those issues and provide fact checks um, as possible policy changes, which may affect the industry. In this way and others, we work in coordination with the administration on a variety of issues. For example, the Deputy Mayor and um, EDC reached out to us for our expertise recently on a redesign of the visitor booth at the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. And we offered advice on signage and design and provided a list of vendors um, who could do that work well. Another example is how we regularly work with uh, the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities to ensure that our visitors with disabilities have the information they need to have a positive experience when visiting the city. We developed a mechanism for our member organizations to highlight their accessible features for visitors on our tourism website. We engage expert writers from the local disability community to contribute written content from their own perspective. We also feature video content created with a local disability advocate and her family, showcasing how accessible the city can be. Based on a recent request from the Speaker's Office, we also are working on new content to better serve autistic travelers. This summer, we held a gathering of our members for what we call NYC Talks, that's our regular education series, um, and this time it was on accessibility, which featured Commissioner Victor Calise. These talks provide our member businesses and organizations an educational opportunity to hear from experts. Additionally, our overall commitment to quality visitor experience requires coordination with multiple agencies. For example, we work closely with relevant agencies when bidding for large-scale events that impact the five boroughs, like the Super Bowl, MLB's All-Star Game, Formula E, and WWE WrestleMania. In June, we helped host World Pride in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, and we led the effort with our agency partners to make the city as welcoming as possible for the five million people who participated. Our Project Rainbow initiative helped spread welcome messaging and pride creative throughout the city to show visitors that all are welcome here. This year's event, by the way, was the largest pride event in history. Um, and that's something that we can all be very proud of. On behalf of the city, we also manage city-owned media, such as street furniture and bus shelters, link NYC screens, and select street pole banners, which requires close coordination with DOT. Also on behalf of the city, we manage the official New York City brands and licensing programs for city agencies like the FDNY and the NYPD. We also engage directly with the public and receive approximately 300 calls a week from residents and visitors that are tourism related. Various bids and chambers throughout the city also send public in inquiries and issues to us as well. This goes for calls routed to 311 also. Our front desk number is listed in all of our guides and on our website, nycgo.com. Primarily, we receive calls asking for visitor information, particularly about tours and shows. Um, if there is a call concerning a regulatory issue, we forward those calls to the appropriate agency point person. We utilize our relationships across agencies to communicate on a regular basis pertinent comments and concerns from the public. Ultimately, we provide research, insights, and sweat equity to create and strengthen policy when it affects the 65 million visitors to New York City. A great visitor experience also requires the support of the city's residents, and we truly appreciate our residents welcoming visitors into our city. 
With that said, we do not take the support, along with the growth and economic prosperity that it brings, for granted. While New York City remains a popular global visitor destination, many cities around the country and around the world are fighting for the same visitors and the same tourism dollars we enjoy here. And so it's crucial we maintain our momentum and that New York City's tourism industry remains a bright spot, the bright spot it continues to be for our economy. And with the Chairman's encouragement, we are currently developing a formal long-range plan for responsible tourism growth, which we look forward to sharing with you in the near future. We are proud of the, of the work uh, we, we are proud to work closely with industry leaders on our board, the City Council, and the Mayor's Office to strengthen and responsibly grow the travel and tourism industry for our city. We value this committee's encouragement and support for the tourism industry. We are grateful to the Council for the recent restoration of a peg to our contract. Uh, and I have included an updated tourism impact rec card um, and the, our annual report to, the, uh, to this testimony. This information supports the dynamism of the travel and tourism industry across the five boroughs of New York. My colleague, Shadon Smith, our Vice President of External Affairs and Community Engagement, who many of you already know, uh, will be briefing you all shortly on our latest neighborhood campaign as well. So that, we can look forward to that coming up. Chairman Vallone, I look forward to our continued partnership um, and I'm grateful for your leadership on this committee. Tourism is often the forgotten engine, and your commitment to shine a light on New York City NYC and company's hard work and contributions to our city is greatly appreciated. Thank you for allowing me this time to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, not only did you do the testimony in record time, I think <laughs> we've just set a record for the quickest reading of five pages of testimony. <laughs> I'm a uh, something the other committee should take note of. Look at that. <laughs> by 1035, the first panel has finished. Uh, we've also been joined by Council Member Lander, and we have questions from Count, uh, Powers, Koo, and Lander. And I'd just like to start us off with uh, thanking you for the testimony. And I, I really believe the, the annual report and the data and the information that New York and Company provides uh, is something that we can all benefit for and I think should also be shared on, on a council level. So one of the things we'll, we'll ask for going forward is the, the sharing of that data on an annual basis because it does really highlight the work that was done and a lot of times often questions that may not get a chance to be answered because it's not part yeah. of a hearing. So part of these hearings will be our commitment to have an annual hearing to give that opportunity to bring the data to the council members and to the um, advocates that are here with us. There are so many different challenges that, I guess, face the tourism industry. I just wanted to get your perspective. I know there's between domestic and international and economic generators and impacts of what's going on. What do you see for this year and maybe for next year as some of the biggest challenges that we face within the tourism industry? Thank you for that question, Council Member. There, uh, it is a volatile time for sure in travel and tourism around the world. Uh, the strength of the U.S. dollar is perhaps one of the biggest challenges that we have in, in attracting international visitors to our city. We focus a lot on international travelers because they tend they stay longer. Um, on average, they stay almost six nights, whereas a domestic traveler will only stay 2.3 nights or so. So they stay longer and they spend more. Um, they also have the opportunity to explore more. Uh, and they, they tend to be more intrepid. And it's no surprise probably to most people in this room, domestic travelers are usually the last ones to get on the subway. Uh, they're usually the last ones to explore more widely. It's the international travelers that are setting the trends uh, and exploring new spots throughout the five boroughs. So they are important for all of those reasons. And the strong dollar is a real challenge uh, to us in the current climate. Uh, I'm happy to report that New York City is, re re is performing well, in, even in light of the strong dollar, because we think New York City, not only is our messaging resonating with travelers from around the world, they also see this as a, as a great place to spend time. They get a multicultural experience in New York. They know they're gonna be welcomed in New York. Um, um, and they feel very comfortable here. Um, they know it's a safe destination. So all of those factors, I think, have contributed to New York performing well, but it is a challenge for us going forward. We also see a lot of other destinations beginning to ramp up their tourism promotion. Uh, so there, there is more competition out there. People say all the time, does New York City need to promote? Uh, and the question is yes, because if we don't, others will, will lure those, um, those visitors away. We see destinations like Chicago and Washington, D.C., even L.A. and San Francisco and Boston, who now is ramping up their efforts, um, really go gunning for our travelers. So it is important to keep New York City front of mind, make sure that they know that the city welcomes them um, and that we are here uh, to support them in any way we can. So where would New York City fall on the spectrum since we mentioned, I believe Las Vegas is always top on spending and where would New York City fall in comparison to other cities and the budgets that they use to for their tourism industry? New York City, I mean, uh, Las Vegas is always at the top. As you said, they're a bit of an outlier. They spend more than $300 million a year on tourism and convention promotion. Um, so our total operating, operating budget is about $40 million. Um, and we would fall to the lower end of the largest city destinations in the country. Um, destinations like Orlando and Los Angeles 
are spending a significant amount more than we are on public promotion. Um, and so that is an area I think where, where we are looking to engage with, with others going forward. And, and of that budget, by half of that is from the mayor's budget and half of that's privately raised? Correct. Uh, the half of our budget is c comes through the contract with SBS, um, and that is about $21 million per year. And then we Have we seen any change in that contract? Thanks to the council, uh, PEG was restored this year, so we want to thank you all for your leadership there. But that contract amount is the same as it was originally in 2006. 16, right? 2006. Six. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so one of the things we like to do is advocate for you and with you, whether, whatever agency was sitting on for our committees. Um, I would like to see that be raised, and I know every one of us would like to see that. In order to remain competitive, I think we need to have a proper investment to give you the tools and resources for New York Company to compete globally and internationally, and not having a change for almost coming up to 2020 on the vision. I, I, it makes so much more demands for you to do that on your own. I think what we need to do is to, to recognize that and also support it and put some things in place that maybe can generate income on short-term and long-term goals. Is there anything that another city or country is doing to maybe support or give more robust income to the tourism industry that maybe we can look at going forward? Thank you for that question, Council Member. There, there is a new funding model that destinations in the United States are turning to uh, for funding, and it is often called a tourism improvement district or tourism marketing district. And we now more than 175 cities across the U.S., including Newark, New Jersey, and Philadelphia, have have uh, turned to this model as an additional supplemental revenue stream for tourism promotion. And it's an assessment on hotel guest folios. So it's paid by the visitors, <clears throat> and only by the visitors to the city. Uh, and it is a small additional uh, assessment that is made um, in similar to the way a bid assessment would be made um, just on hotel folios for guests that is earmarked for tourism promotion so again using them to help fund additional promotion to bring more visitors to town be they convention delegates trade shows big events or leisure travelers and have we had any conversations with the hotel industry as to maybe where they may support or not support that plan? We've had some early conversations uh, with the hotel community, and so far they seem to be very interested in this model. Many of them operate in other cities where this model is already in place. So they have seen the successes that have come in places like Los Angeles and San Francisco, um, places like Portland and Seattle. The West Coast um, has really led the charge on this effort. It's now coming as a popular model more to the East Coast. But many of them operate in these markets where this model exists, and they have seen the success that it can bring. And they're very interested in seeing how we could advance the conversation. Well, anything that I, I believe we can generate income that's not coming off taxpayers here in New York City, that is also for those who would, I think would expect to pay for that experience a small amount. We all do that when we travel. I mean, there's not a time I go where I'm not, it's not included on my bill in some way, shape, or form, my contribution to that city's uh, economy. So I, I would wholeheartedly think that might be something we can address going forward. Um, you mentioned with the hotel. So what are some of the other, because some, some of the folks may not have been with our last year's hearing. So in general, when we talk about the tourism industry, what other affiliates and partners comprise that industry? So the hotels, of course, make up the, the most obvious uh, part of the tourism industry, and, and we have many of them that are part of our organization, and we work closely hand-in-hand -hand with them across the five boroughs. Um, you also have arts and cultural organizations, which are critically important because it's oftentimes arts and culture that are bringing people to our city, whether it's the large museums, it's festivals, it's smaller museums and culturals um, across the five boroughs. It is a huge asset for New York, and we work closely with them. Then we also have the retailers, um, and we work closely with a lot of small businesses. Uh, we feel very strongly, and we're committed to the small business of New York City because without the small businesses, uh, New York City is not New York City. Um, and that includes the pizza parlors, that includes our, our neighborhood restaurants um, that are, are having a tougher time today than they had in the past uh, with escalating rents and other costs. So we work closely on promoting them, the flavor of New York, what you come to New York for. Um, also that goes for um, retailers. Um, we work with large retailers like Macy's and, and Bloomingdale's and Century 21 um, and small shops as well uh, across the five boroughs. Tour operators um, and tour guides are also a very important component and we work closely with them and all the major attractions that are for profit, whether it be Statue Cruises or Circle Line, um, we work closely with them in, in bringing tourism to New York City. So could we get an estimate on the jobs that's provided within that those fields combined on how that impacts New York City? Absolutely. Our latest estimate, and, and you see it in the record in the annual report, is 396,000 jobs 
across the five boroughs. That's both direct employment, and you referenced earlier indirect employment as well. That's folks that work in the industry that support hospitality and tourism. It could be accountants, it could be lawyers that are working with some of these businesses, uh, work that is induced from the, the visitor economy. Um, and we do take a percentage of restaurant jobs. Uh, I think you referenced earlier that obviously not all restaurants in New York are serving only visitors. Um, so we take a percentage of restaurant jobs as one example of a slice of the hospitality community. Same goes for retail to a degree. But it is a record number of, of employment that is attributed to the visitor economy at 396,000. And we think that will continue to grow. So I know some of the students from CUNY are here today. They came up this morning to say hi, and they were interested. The smiles in the back, so thanks for coming. I think one of the things we're always trying to provide that bridge for job and career paths for folks straight from high school into college or, or on whatever level we can get them to these industries and borough-wide. I think as a Queens Council member, I'm always trying to bring the vision to the outer boroughs because we don't. it's not always just about Manhattan. And all of the efforts that we're doing now, we're doing it. So maybe take a moment to how would, a, how would a student or someone who's looking to get a career, what are some of the things that New York City and Company or EDC is doing to help them on that path? Thank you, Council Member, for that question. And it's a great one. And welcome to the, all the students that are here today. Uh, it's great to see folks interested in hospitality and travel and tourism. Um, it is a great path. Uh, to a great career. It's super rewarding, especially if you can help give back to your community. We feel strongly that, that the tourism industry in New York should support local kids. And we're doing everything we can to make sure that the jobs go to local kids in the communities. Not in every neighborhood, perhaps, has a big cultural attraction in it, but, they, but there are students and kids that live throughout every borough of New York City and every neighborhood. And we think every neighborhood should be able to be positively impacted from, for tourism in that way as well. So we're working closely with some of our colleagues. We've had great conversations with the educational institutions in New York City. We've had early talks with Hunter and CUNY, of course, in particular, but also we've talked to NYU and even Columbia about what, what would a new program look like to help bring even more awareness and education to the community, for especially for students that perhaps aren't college bound. If, if a four-year degree is not in their plans, what could they do to learn a little bit more about travel and hospitality? A certification program we think might be warranted, and we've had some early talks about what that could look like. We've shared that with uh, some of our colleagues at SBS um, and, uh, and EDC. And we think that there is a real opportunity there to bring more awareness um, and some, some education um, opportunities to the students of New York um, to help them uh, build a career in hospitality and tourism. The, the private sector wants to employ the local community. Um, and if we can help prepare the young people of New York City for careers in hospitality and tourism, I think that is a win-win for everyone. I, I agree. And I think there's an opportunity there for growth that's right at our doorsteps for our students, especially having two daughters in college now and a little guy who's looking at high schools that we want to provide as parents every opportunity right here in New York City, whether it's whatever borough you're in, I think that's very important. So Fred, you had mentioned the different partners that you're responsible to, to assist and facilitate in, and it does involve the little guy right up to the big guy. So whether it's restaurants, whether it's Broadway, whether it's in Queens, Bronx, or Brooklyn, our, our cultural centers, it's there. I think the, the impetus for the bill was to try to assist everyone when there is a project that may impact from the pizzeria straight to Disney's Aladdin on 42nd Street. So. Uh, I, I'm looking at maybe and, and looking for some of your thoughts on w what we do today and maybe if we create this bill, what we could do tomorrow to foster that interagency coordination. And it's not just here. It's in every committee that the council members hold. It's one of the first questions that Brad and all the rest of us ask on how do we facilitate interagency coordination to make sure that the partners and the business engine of New York City is flowing and not hampered by an ill-advised project that might be coming. And I think that's what the, the focus is behind on 1774. So just your thoughts on, on that um, issue and or problem that we face in New York City every day. Just I did driving in today with a construction site that decided to take over three lanes when they were only supposed to be in one and sat 15 minutes extra trying to get. And I said, who the heck would I call <laughs> to make that complaint and not deal with 311? And I'm sure the five businesses that were affected by that on the street, it's, it's the same issue they're asking for. Yeah, thank you, Council Member, for that question. It, the, the intent of the bill we absolutely support. We understand um, the the uh, idea that you're putting forward and we support the intent of, of more communication absolutely uh, and quicker answers is always a, a great idea. Um, we defer to the administration and to the council on the legislative uh, approach to that of course um, but you know we work closely on a day-to-day -day basis as I referenced earlier with with multiple agencies and for our members and constituents we're able to effectively um, 
channel their questions to the appropriate authorities and help them with answers. I know Shadon, for example, my colleague, and I both deal with these on a regular basis. Um, and but, but any additional support and attention that you bring is certainly appreciated. And I appreciate that. The idea is to, to create an office that can assist and coordinate that. And I think in, in the role that you're focused on when you're competing the entire world, um, finding out who in the parks department is probably the last thing you want to do at that point on, on, on who's got responsibility for shoveling the sidewalk on that. So um, maybe just a couple of EDC, Sabrina. So just what are some of your uh, thoughts with EDC, especially with maybe some recent projects that may be looking toward the tourism industry in general? I know uh, kind of catching you a little bit off guard because this was really with New York and company. But I want to give you an opportunity since tourism falls within the parameters of EDC on what you see within the tourism industry, how do you reflect in the budget, and maybe some projects that EDC will be working on with that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there we go. All right. So uh, thank you, committee, and, and thank you, um, chairman and the city council for having me to here today. Um, so just for everyone in the room, so EDC's uh, mission is to um, create shared prosperity across all five boroughs by growing good jobs and strengthening neighborhoods. And so a lot of our focus is obviously on New Yorkers, right? Growing those good jobs for New Yorkers. However, because of the tremendous work that we do across several sectors, the residual benefits affect tourism. And we're really proud of the work that we've been able to do um, throughout different departments within EDC. So to give you um, some small examples, our funding agreements team is really committed to helping cultural institutions with their infrastructure, with building capital improvements. So when you look at the Natural Museum um, of American History and being able to do their expansion of the Gilder Science Center, that is an EDC project. That in turn um, creates more buzz, more opportunity for tourists to come and really enjoy that cultural institution. So it's a bit of a peripheral um, role that we play, not necessarily always directly, sometimes directly tourism, but a lot of the times it's in that peripheral zone that we are in. So for example, like Essex Market, it's a fantastic public market in the Lower East Side that has generated significant buzz for residents and, and local um, lo the local community, but then in turn, tourists are very attracted to it and are able to also um, be able to visit and enjoy uh, that as well. And so that's kind of where we see EDC playing that role. Well, the testimony and one of the things we talked about was that the sector itself is the fourth largest creation of jobs in the city. And to me, that in itself demands attention because if we're dealing about a New York City thriving economy, any sector of the industry that's creating the, that amount of jobs we need to really focus on and make sure we're supporting it. So an EDC's role as the, as the parent company, so to speak, of mm -hmm. all of that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is there any uh, strategy to increase the employment in the tourism industry and or support those jobs that are created within the sector, just like Fred was talking about? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, uh, council member, for that question. So. The role that EDC plays, we have a very robust, um, we're following a very robust jobs plan that you, you may be familiar with, 100,000 jobs over the next 10 years. Um, right, the, but we didn't include tourism. In that's that, and correct. That's part, and that's part of my rallying cry is to make sure we do that. That's correct. And the reason for that, and, and again, this might be a little, a bit out of my purview, but for EDC, the industries that were, um, that were selected to focus on, whether that's life sciences or tech or arts and culture or creative, um, are industries that are in need of significant job growth, not that tourism isn't, but we do believe that the job growth plan that we have for those specific industries do have residual benefits to make us a more inclusive city, to make us a fairer and stronger city. Do we have any RFPs that are coming or currently issued that could reflect that? Focus. I can I can go back to the team and come back to you with that. Um, I don't want to speak out of turn, but yeah, I, I, I think that would be important. So absolutely. I think this this, this hearing is going to be an annual hearing. We may even do biannual just updates because there's so many. Whether we're talking about the hotel industry, restaurants, ferries, uh, tourists, out of borough participation, mm -hmm. this this can go on, uh, and that's why we, each of the council members is going to have questions. So my, I guess the last question would be: So who would does EDC handle that now if we have that? agency issue on a pr something that may be affecting the tourism industry now? Would, would their phone call go to you or is that going someplace else or is that part of the reason why hopefully you're going to support 1774 to create this office? Yeah, no, and we, we uh, 
we do support the intent of the bill. We understand, and, and to Fred's point so earlier. So we're two for two. That's it. It's <laughs> over. Everybody go home. We're good to go. <laughs> uh, we think there's there's a lot of good things in there, and, and Fred and his team at NYC and Co. does a tremendous job at really being kind of that central um, office that are, is able to kind of field a lot of those tourism issues. Um, and a lot of, to your point, council member, a lot of the tourism issues are resident issues, right? And so we, just as NYC and Co. has stated, also work comp very close with all of our sister agency partners. So when there is a, an issue with a construction site that's blocking two or three lanes, um, you know, we do field our own 311 calls as it relates to properties that we oversee and manage and projects that we're developing. Um, but if we have those uh, lines of communication with DOT um, or with DCLA as it results, you know, with any of our cultural institutions, to be able to connect with them and field those to the appropriate agency. And I think that's really what we're trying to do is to make that central office the the, the group or the person that can do that. Now, uh, the last thought would be, would you have a suggestion along with Fred as to having future conversations as to where that office should be, whether it should be through your, through EDC, whether it's in the mayor's office somewhere else, whether it's in New York and company, but the creation of the office, I believe, will be coming. It's just a matter of making sure we get this right, put it in the right so we can have our advocates uh, access it, use it, and, and grow it to the point where it can be that right arm to the industries that need it in navigating all of our city agencies. So my thought would be, uh, do you have a thought where that should be and what's your recommendation? Yeah, I, I would defer to NYC and Co. Um, we see them as the preeminent leader of all things tourism, and, and so I would defer to Fred. And, and all right, Fred, you have some homework for us. <laughs> uh, Thank you. So while we have the panel, uh, I'd like to give Council Member Powers, who's signed up for questions and powers, then Koo and then Lander. Great. Council Thank you. Board. Thanks for the testimony. And uh, I'm disappointed at the venue this time because yeah. last time was <laughs> <coughs> much nicer. Um, thanks for the thanks for the testimony. Am I, I, I saw on your uh, your one of your handouts, but estimate for this year in terms of uh, visitors is over 66 million. 67 million, almost 67. 67. With 67 million. What do you account for the? That's a two million more. What is there any? operating theory behind that or just kind of continue growth of the city? Uh, thank you, Council Member, for the question. I, I would like to say a lot of the good work that my colleagues have done have contributed in part um, to that number, but um, the city itself is responsible for an enormous amount uh, of the, the robust growth that we have seen. The growth in the hotel sector in particular has enabled us to host more visitors year over year. I mean, we now have 122,000 hotel rooms across the five boroughs. Um, the, the fastest growth uh, actually has been in the boroughs outside of Manhattan in terms of new hotels open, which is terrific. Um, that brings more opportunities. Um, and so travelers, um, I think, not only have more access to New York because of because of the, the additional hotel rooms, but we've had a remarkable year this year. I mean, World Pride alone is estimated to bring in, you know, that we heard the mayor say 5 million um, visitors. Um, that, of course, has contributed significantly. The arts and cultural organizations as, as well have had uh, a blockbuster year in terms of major art exhibitions across the five boroughs. I mean, you can just look at the Frida Kahlo exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum as one example of that, that people have come from around the world to take part in, in those developments. And the amount of new development that has just happened in the, in the private sector, I mean, whether it's Empire Outlets in, in Staten Island, even Hudson Yards, what's happened at, um, at South Street Seaport, um, there, there's an enormous amount of investment that has happened in the private sector that is keeping New York not only top of mind, but in the press around the world as a hot destination to visit. Um, we were really thrilled this year with World Pride in particular, the New York Times, our own hometown newspaper, which is sometimes the hardest outlet to get news in, um, actually featured for the first time ever an LGBT 36 hours feature uh, around Pride and Stonewall's 50th. So it just brought an enormous amount of attention uh, to New York this year. We were able to capitalize on that, work with our partners, work with people like Virgin Atlantic, who launched the first ever Pride flight to New York City. The first time ever in history an entire crew was captained and staffed by the LGBT community. Um, and they brought journalists and press from, from the UK to New York to be here for World Pride. It was a tremendous window into New York um, that, uh, that couldn't have happened without the support of Virgin Atlantic. That's just one small example of how we work with industry partners to bring a spotlight to New York. So we think it's, it's, it's a combination of factors, um, and that's the, the intersection that we work in all the time. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I, you know, over the last few months, I think we've heard, or I know I have heard, a number of concerns around 
the experience once somebody arrives here, but not separate, not a isolated to a visitor. Certainly, uh, in, uh, experienced by New Yorkers as well. Tick, we, we've heard stories about t horror stories about Battery Park City around ticket sellers, Times Square costume characters, and other issues around there. I see the folks from the Alliance here as well. Central Park, I've heard issues around quality of life, Rockefeller Center around the holidays. I've been trying to work around improving the experience there. Can you share with us any feedback you're receiving or you're surveying or you're when you're hearing or and then maybe some recommendations about how to address the, the, the concerns once people get here. It's I, I, I don't necessarily think they're going to become major reductions in tourism, but certainly I think they would, you know, um, they can, can lead to people deciding not to visit certain areas or just to sort of get outside of the area they're staying in or second, just leave them with a less than desirable experience and, and, and potentially not wanting to return back. Um, do you hear these same stories? Can you share with us any of the feedback you hear from folks or if you do surveys on it and then, yeah, any recommendations? Thank you, Councilmember, for the question. It is an area of intense focus. Uh, you know, I mean, to put it into context, I mean, there was a time when New York City did not have a great represent, rep uh, reputation in terms of safety and friendliness and acceptance. That has changed vastly due to the work of a lot of people. Obviously, not only the, um, the mayor's office and, and the city council, but NYPD and others that have made this now the safest big city in America. And we still need to tell that story quite often. Um, and we think it's also the friendliest city in America. Uh, we New Yorkers are just busy. We sometimes don't slow down enough to say hello, but if you need help, we are there for you. Um, and so I think, you know, there we have come a very long way. Um, and people feel safe in New York. I think that also is playing into uh, the, the decision for travelers to come here versus other destinations. They, they see New York in the media every day. Um, and these issues do have an impact. Um, be it small, they can add up over time, they can eat away at the fringe. Of, of visitor experience and, and it, it impacts residents as well as it does visitors and it is an area I think that we have to continue to focus on. Um, there, we believe there is a regulatory framework there that would ensure that not that while there are employment opportunities and we want to make sure that we are growing jobs, um, but that it is done in a way that um, that only contributes to the to the experience and that the regulatory framework is supported. So um, we would like to have more dialogue around this issue uh, and it is an area that that we. Um, find ourselves in quite often and in referring um, interagency coordination on these issues, whether it be the Batty Park issue or the Central Park issue or Times Square, uh, Rockefeller Center, um, we hear these uh, quite often from travelers and from our business partners and, and the bids in particular. So um, it, it is something that I think uh, more conversation should be had around. Yeah, one recommendation, as I noticed that I've been working with the folks around the Times Square issue, I hear things at Central Park, I've also heard from the folks at Battery Park, and there's other areas that I'm obviously not thinking about that that is one place I think needs some coordination. Like, a, like, a, like I think you guys are doing a fantastic job in terms of getting these numbers to continue to climb. And I think it, whether it's with New York City and companies leadership or UDC's involvement or others, having the four, maybe agent DOT, NYPD, DCA, maybe it's parks, you know, to have a clearer uh, way to move forward on some of these issues, because it is everyday New Yorkers when they go to Staten Island Ferry or they walk, they work around Times Square that experience this, but also the folks that uh, are, are coming here for the first, second, third, fourth time who um, don't want to feel like they're getting exploited. Obviously, we don't want them right. to be exploited. So that, that's the one place where I think rather than having to do all of these, you know, one regulatory framework at a time, it, it, it feels like there are some there's some way to do a coordinated, a coordinated effort to address some of these issues as where there is common area or to have a more dedicated place to do them. Um, the the term is I just I'll close I'll just close it now with this but um, the tourism improvement district so um, where where do they have those right now so we you can provide you West with Coast, the list I think, but yeah it, it began in California okay um, even the state of California today uses this model to fund their state tourism efforts uh, but it began there um, and you there are I think more than fifty destinations in California alone that use this model large and small cities um, but it is now moving across the country and we can provide you with that list as I said but it is it is now uh, a popular idea on the East Coast Philadelphia has a tourism marketing development fund Baltimore is the newest they just implemented one um, in the last few weeks it has it has 
gone into effect. And Newark, New Jersey, actually, um, built their new Convention of Visitors Bureau with that funding model in place. And we know Boston is now looking at it, too. So what it's doing is it's supplementing the public funds that are coming and the private funds um, with, with some additional revenue and resources that, that are helping these destinations be competitive. And, and what's the normal assessment for, like, a, it's, I assume it's on a nightly stay at a hotel room? Yes, it, it varies widely. Um, it can be a percentage of, of room night rate, um, or it can be a flat dollar amount. Um, I know in some destinations, like in San Francisco, I believe it's around 2%. We can provide you with some of the statistics as well. Because of the size of the market in New York, we don't believe it needs to be anywhere near that high. It could be a much smaller amount um, because we sell so many more room nights than other destinations. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. But we also have a bill we put in last year together, 1276, with some of the advocates. I see Tim here with the uh, dashboard that we talked about. So I think we're going to push that again. I think, um, Fred, we talked about the a tourism economy dashboard and some of the current concerns, whether it's proprietary or just getting it forward. Do we, do we have an update on that? I'd like to really see some way to additionally promote tourism. And I think a dashboard uh, application, an app, a website, uh, coordination of what's going on, um, besides the data from who's who's purchasing things, I think might something we can revisit and, and make sure we get that done. Thank you, Council Member, for that question. We are working on some new data sources. Um, in fact, we have some new vendors that we're working with as well and trying to figure out how much of that information can we share publicly because much of it is licensed um, and it isn't meant to be shared widely and because that is it's a subscription model. But we are working on that and we would love to, to engage with you more. Perfect. Okay. Council Member Koo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dixon, for your testimony. Yeah. And thank you, our chair. Uh, my question is, uh, among all the visitors to New York City, <clears throat> how much are from overseas? This is 13.5 uh, million, uh, million people. Thank you, Council Member, for the question. Yes, there are 13.5 million international travelers currently to New York City. It represents, on average, about 20% of the total. Mm. So among the group, uh, who, who, which, which one is the largest group from, from, from which country? Thank you for the question. The largest is the United Kingdom, um, followed uh, by, by China. That's yeah. number two. So during the, 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 for the last few months, the, the the President Trump and China, they have a trade war. Uh, does that affect the tourist industry? Thank you for the question, Council Member. This is a, an area that we focus on intensely, um, monitoring the, the impacts, but also determining what uh, what can be done about this question. Um, there is indication that there has been a downturn in visitation to the United States from the Chinese market. Um, it is believed that some of it is related to the to the trade war tensions. Um, there has been a tightening of visa issuance, um, largely for first time visitors to to the United States that are coming for corporate incentive trips. So if if, if you are uh, a member, if you work for a company in China and every year they do a large incentive trip for their top salespeople, for example, um, they have you know we of course promote the United States and New York as a great choice for that trip. And uh, if if the individual traveler has not traveled outside of China or the region before, the United States government is now issuing uh, not issuing visas as widely. Um, they have begun to restrict those to some degree. We do know the Chinese government because of the control of of a lot of tour operators and businesses in China. They do have the ability to turn down the travel volume. We're fortunate in New York to see that traffic has been up and it continues to grow. So New York is a bit of an exception um, to some of that. Um, but it is an area that we are monitoring very closely. And, and we are concerned that, that if the trade war continues, um, and the, the dollar also is playing a strong role in that situation, that we could have some challenges there. Some areas, if I may, that we are working on to address that. I'm, I'm happy to share that we are actually launching a new WeChat mini program for New York City. Um, that and it will be pro the first program for any destination in the United States that also includes the ability to buy tickets. So working with our industry partners um, and WeChat Pay, you will be actually be able to, as a Chinese traveler, to explore New York City more widely in your language um, and actually even transact in your own financial um, currencies uh, using WeChat Pay. So that is a big advantage. We're working to make New York more Chinese friendly, and we think these and other promotions will help us stay ahead of some of these political challenges. Okay, uh, my second question is like most of the tourist dollars uh, stay in Manhattan, right? So how do you, in the future, as head of the NYC company, 
to make some tours, to encourage more tourists to go to other boroughs, the Queens, which we offer a lot of attractions. But somehow we don't have that much, that many tourists coming. You know? Thank you for the question, Council Member. It, it is an area of intense focus for us, and it has been for quite a long time. And one of the things that has contributed normalcy to that is the new hotels that have opened in the boroughs. Of course, if visitors are staying in the boroughs, they're more likely to explore there. So that is a, a built-in advantage. But we also have been promoting the neighborhoods for more than a decade now, whether it was our Neighborhood by Neighborhood campaign, which we worked with the Council on in the past. We're uh, about to launch a new version of that campaign just this fall. And one, of the, one of the great things about New York is the rich multicultural offering and the diversity of, of our communities. Mm. That is what travelers want today. Um, the trend in travel today is experiential. People want to come. They will see the icons. If you're a first-time visitor, there's no question you're going to go to the top of an observation deck. You're going to go to the Statue of Liberty. You're going to want to see Central Park. But you also want to visit um, the communities. And, and we want to make sure that they're doing that in a responsible way, that they aren't just going into a community and snapping a photo and putting on Instagram and leaving, that they actually are supporting the community. They're eating locally. They're buying locally, uh, respecting the culture. These things are very important as our numbers grow and and we feel a, a great sense of responsibility to make sure that that happens but uh, the content on our website has never been more robust uh, for the neighborhoods and the promotion that we're doing to not only encourage visitors to explore the neighborhoods but also other New Yorkers it, you know it may not be a surprise to anyone in the room that it, sometimes it's harder to get people to travel from one borough to another than it is to get visitors come from outside of New York to New York. So we work uh, on the local level to encourage, and to encourage interborough tourism um, and to encourage New Yorkers also to post and brag about their favorite spots. Um, it is those small cultural gems and jewels, the favorite neighborhood, neighborhood spots that need our support and that visitors want to explore. So it is an area of intense focus for us. Not only is it good business for the neighborhoods and boroughs, it's good for New York City overall. Okay, my, my last question is about um it's about bathrooms, yeah. Because as a tourist, when I go overseas, uh, that's what's important to, to, to me, right? I think it's important to everyone. Uh, but somehow in New York City, uh, we don't provide public bathrooms. You know, you, there's no bathroom in the subways. Or, or there's very few bathrooms in the parks, you know. And sometimes even though they have a, a bathroom in the park, but they're closed, you know, they're locked, right? <laughs> so how do we help tourists? How do you help tourists to address this problem? Thank you, Councilman, for that question. And, and I have noticed that same thing as well when traveling abroad or, or in other destinations. And, and I think it is an area we should continue to focus on. Um, we work with our partners, of course. You know, we, we make sure that everyone is aware that, you know, public restrooms um, oftentimes will increase the traffic to your location, uh, but the private sector can only do so much. So I would, um, it is a bit out of my purview, but but I would, I would encourage more exploration around this topic um, because I feel that as visitor volumes grow, especially in public spaces, um, it is part of the public good to make sure that those services would be available. Yeah, because uh, when you're in Europe, you know, if you if you pay uh, 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 50 cents, you can get the, use the bathroom. But around here, they, they say, oh, private uh, bathrooms are only for customers only, right? So if you find some way to encourage them, hey, if they are tourists, no, they don't use the bathroom. I don't think they, they mind to pay 50 cents to use the bathroom or 25 cents. No. So this is something we have to look into because I heard a lot of complaints that this we are one of the most advanced countries, but we don't we don't provide platforms. Yeah. Fred, you got to work on that. Yes, <laughs> agreed. Thank you, Councilmember Koo, uh, and also thank you to the first panel. Before we let you go, I think we we did discuss interborough tourism. I think that's a, a real uh, topic for something we can talk about future. And I, I and in speaking with the advocates, so many different degrees of quality of life continue to come to impact in small ways that we we need to be aware of so this office would be something to facilitate that also between whether it's the nypd or sanitation dot small business edc i think those are things that we can do a better job at so i'd like to thank uh, both of you for your testimony we're going to have our first panel come forward if you guys could maybe stick around and hear some of the, the advocates and maybe the students um, from the Broadway League is Madison Summers. So I know Madison and Christine, we were trying to get a spot on in Broadway. Oh, oh I see we have a switch. Madison is not Madison. Uh, Samara Karasik from the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. Charles Savino from the Center of Urban Future. And Tim Tompkins from the Times Square Alliance. If you guys can come on up. We were trying to get around somewhere on Broadway. We will work better to get that done for next year.
We also been joined by Council Member Joe and I from the Bronx. So if you'd like to ask some questions after the panel or if, come on in, uh, if you guys want to, whoever wants I'll to start first. Oh. Hi, I'm Tom Ferrugia. I'm the Director of Governmental Affairs for the Broadway League. Madison stepped out, so I'm kind of jumping in for her. I did fill out a, a, a card, though. Um, I can so, vouch for you, Tom. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Great to see you, <laughs> Councilman. Um, so uh, just for background, the League uh, is the principal trade association for the commercial theater industry. We represent over 700 theater owners, operators, producers, presenters, and general managers, um, and suppliers of goods and services uh, across North America and around the world to the theatrical industry. We are grateful for Chairman Vallone and other distinguished members of the Economic Development Committee for giving us the opportunity to address the Council on the theater industry's impact on New York tourism economy. Um, Councilman Powers was just here, so we wanted to acknowledge him. He is a great representative and does a lot to support the businesses in, in Times Square, the district that he represents. Um, in addition to its unique cultural significance, Broadway is a massive economic and tourism driver that brings an average of 40,500 40, theater patrons into Midtown Manhattan every day. Each year we host millions of travelers from all over the globe who come to attend a live show and spend money in our city. We sold 14.8 million Broadway tickets in the theater season ending May of 2019. In the previous season, ending in May 2018, the most recent year for which we have demographic information, 8.6 million tickets were purchased by theater goers residing outside New York City, and that includes 2 million international visitors. I'd like to note that 61.3% of foreign visitors who attend a show report that Broadway is one of their most important reasons for visiting New York City. Broadway's cumulative fiscal impact on New York was $12.6 billion last year. Um, collectively, Broadway directly employs 12,600 individuals, most of who are unionized. Uh, actors, directors, ushers, electrician, and advertising agencies. Spend, um, spending by Broadway patrons supported an additional 74,500 jobs in restaurant shops, hotels, and livery services. In addition, Broadway tours often employ performers, technicians, and others who reside in New York and many road production costs are incurred in the state. We include the full economic impact of those productions. Touring Broadway's economic impact on New York City is an, is an additional $400 million. Broadway has a long history of partnering with the city. The council is a generous sponsor of our Family First Night program, which provides a series of unique theatrical events to underprivileged families, and of our new Broadway Bridges program, which endeavors to ensure that every single New York City public high school student will attend a Broadway show before graduation, which is approximately 70,000 students from DOE. The league sponsors Broadway Week, administered by NYC & Co., which is a semi-annual event that encourages theater attendance by offering two-for-one tickets. Uh, we also work closely with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment and collaborate to promote Broadway-related PSAs on Taxi TV. Um, despite several hope uh, several high-profile successes, a surprising four out of five Broadway shows fail to recoup their capitalization and close within 12 months. Bro Broadway productions are incredibly risky and expensive projects that are primarily supported by groups of individual backers. Due to rising production costs, attracting investment is an extraordinary challenge. Going forward, we encourage the council to continue supporting legislation that removes economic barriers to meeting operating expenses, recovering capital, and advertising productions. This would include intros 1371 and 1372, sponsored by Councilman Powers, that would reduce the commercial rent tax burden for over 1,000 businesses in Midtown Manhattan, as well as eliminate tax altogether on theatrical advertising in Times Square. We'd also encourage um, continued police, um, sorry, we also encourage continuing, pol uh, continuing policies that promote easy access to Times Square and alleviate obstacles and disincentives to visiting Midtown. This includes improved oversight of the many street activities and fares that lead to massive vehicle and pedestrian congestion. Again, we thank you for this opportunity to address the committee, and we appreciate the Council's ongoing support, collaboration, and recognition of the reciprocal benefit of supporting an industry that is critical to New York City's tourism economy and to maintaining its status as one of the world's cultural epicenters. I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Tom, real quick, on the bill today, 1774, we support for an interagency coordination? We are deferring to NYC and company on that. We don't feel qualified to uh, uh, d discuss how the, the interagency, how the city should operate inter, inter city. So we are, we are going to uh, uh, defer to Fred and however uh, his, uh, his uh, team feels that, that 
the city should progress on that. Well, Councilmember Powers and I are still working on 1371 and 72 on the commercial rent tax and trying to make sure that gets reduced. And thank you for the data on the tech tickets, because that's what we're looking for, mm -hmm. on the those who are purchasing tickets from residing out in New York City and those within New York City. That's mm -hmm. also important yep. information. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Vallone and members of the Committee on Economic Development. I am Samara Karasik, Chief Policy Officer at the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. The Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce is among the largest and most influential business advocacy organizations in New York, having spent the last hundred years developing and promoting policies that drive economic development and advance its member interests. Over the last number of years, we have played a central role in Brooklyn's tourism economy, convening local institutions and businesses to bring Brooklyn to the forefront of tourism marketing in New York. We have brought groups of hotels and businesses to the International Pow Wow Tourism Conference annually. We have developed visitor trail guides to chocolate, beer, wine, and distilleries in our borough, and launched our first ever Brooklyn Passport in 2018, a digital photo guide of 100 things to do and see in the borough. However, it is incredibly difficult to fund our num numerous tourism efforts and market them properly, a reason we were unable to participate in IPW last year. Our tourism partners are eager to work with us, but are generally small businesses and nonprofit organizations that cannot fund large marketing efforts. Nationally, chambers have shown to be ideal partners for tourism marketing because they know the local community and tourism stakeholders better than anyone else. The New York City Council should encourage a more focused effort and partnership among New York City and Company and the Chambers of Commerce. There must be tourism marketing resources dedicated specifically to the outer boroughs. The economic importance of tourism in New York City is well documented. In 2018, a record 65 million people visited New York City, making it one of the most popular cities to visit in the United States. Many of these visitors flocked to Brooklyn to experience our wonderful cultural institutions, such as the Brooklyn Museum, Brooklyn Academy of Music, and Brooklyn Botanic Gardens. People come here to experience our beautiful parks, from Brooklyn Bridge Park to Prospect Park and Coney Island. Brooklyn is also home to major concert and sporting event spaces with Barclays Center, King's Theater, and MCU Stadium. Tourists also know Brooklyn as a culinary de destination. These visitors patronize our fantastic restaurants, shop at our local stores, and rest their heads at one of our 2,100 hotels. Aside from the revenue that tourism creates, this key industry creates local jobs, with 17% of all Brooklyn employment represented by hospitality and retail jobs. Since 2010, this sector has grown approximately 73%, adding roughly 20,000 jobs and $2 billion a year in spending. In fact, in Brooklyn and Manhattan alone, there has been an 81% increase in employment at museums and cultural institutions over the past 15 years. The data speaks for itself. Tourism puts New Yorkers to work in stable and good-paying jobs and is an important revenue driver for our local businesses. It is crucial that the city continue to build on the strong work of New York City and Company and its local partners to bolster the tourism economy, specifically in the outer boroughs. We look forward to continuing to work with the City Council on this issue. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Samara. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Charles Shaviro. I am the data researcher at the Center for an Urban Future, an independent think tank focused on expanding economic opportunity and growing the economy in New York City. I'll be reading testimony prepared for today by our executive director, Jonathan Bowles. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, for more than 20 years now, the Center for an Urban Future has been closely monitoring the city's economy and developing strategies to create more good jobs across the five boroughs. During that time, few things have been more important to the city's economic renaissance or more overlooked than New York's booming tourism economy. Last year, the Center for an Urban Future published a report in partnership with Times Square Alliance and the Association for a Better New York, which provided a new level of detail about the growing impact of tourism on the city's economy. Twenty years ago, roughly 33 million tourists visited New York City. Last year, it was over 65 million. We found that this boom in tourism has spurred hundreds of thousands of jobs. Our research showed that there are now at least 291,000 direct jobs in tourism in New York City, which is more than in finance and nearly twice as many jobs as in the city's tech sector. Our report also found that tourism has become an increasingly important source of middle-income jobs in New York. For instance, the city is now home to nearly as many hotel jobs, which pay $62,000 per year on average as jobs in manufacturing, which pay an average of $58,000.
But as important as tourism has become to the city's economy, New York's tourism sector faces several challenges that, if not addressed, could cause tourism to slip and jobs to decline. One, New York has never adequately planned for a city with 65 million tourists a year or made sufficient investments in its tourism infrastructure to sustain this many annual visitors. And two, tourism has never been a meaningful part of the city's economic development strategy. New York City is fortunate to have what is arguably the world's most sophisticated tourism promotion agency, NYC and Company. But funding for the agency has not kept pace with competitors across the globe, and the agency will need sustained revenue to grow its impact in the years ahead. In addition, many of the challenges facing the tourism sector go well beyond tourism promotion. They require help and support from a range of other city agencies, in particular the EDC. That's why we recommend establishing a dashboard for the city's tourism economy. Given the increasing importance of tourism to the city's economy, EDC should develop a top-level tourism dashboard similar to how it produces economic research about other leading industries like healthcare, life sciences, and finance. We also believe that establishing an office of interagency tourism affairs could be valuable if it elevates the importance of the tourism industry as a priority across city agencies, and it is done in a way that empowers NYC and company. Most important, the city should create a long-term tourism plan. Adding 32 million tourists since 2000 leads to a host of challenges. Where to park the tour buses that flood the neighborhoods near Times Square? How to better handle street and sidewalk congestion? And how to ensure that the boroughs outside Manhattan are prepared to share in the benefits of increased visitation? New York City should develop a strategic tourism plan that is attuned to the unique challenges of sustaining more than 65 million tourists per year while maintaining New York's edge in an increasingly competitive global environment. Thank you for bringing this important issue to light and for the chance to testify today. Charles, thank you. And tell Jonathan, thank you also with the work that you and Tim did and all the advocates. Really is a reason why we've kind of taken off here with this committee with all your recommendations. So we thank you for that. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tim Tompkins from the Times Square Alliance, and thank you all the committee members and Council Member Vallone. Thank you, Council Member Vallone, for all that you've done for economic development in the city and, and for all that your family has done over generations. So um, we've heard all about how, how important uh, tourism is in terms of a generator of jobs and good jobs. And as, as compelling as this information is, we continue to believe that there's major gaps in how the city's economic development agencies measure tourism's total contribution to the city's economy and especially the number of New Yorkers living in every neighborhood whose jobs depend on tourism as well as the secondary effect of spending. Just to give one example, data we purchased from Visa shows that $27.9 million was spent by Visa card holders on just retail and restaurants in Jamaica and Southeast Queens. Having EDC purchase and analyze that data would help the city understand in a more nuanced way how tourism flows through different neighborhoods uh, and creates jobs in different neighborhoods in different ways. Um, in, um, uh, in EDC's economic snapshot employment reports that they publish, um, there's no aggregate number that represents jobs driven by tourism. You, you have hospitality um, and you have arts in a separate category, but there's no aggregate number. Now, part of that has been pointed out is because of the historic ways in which job uh, categories are tracked, but I think that it, more attention could be paid to that. And also on EDC's website, for example, I'll read you the list of industries under their Explore Industries tab on their website. Uh, cyber security, emerging tech, fashion, finance, healthcare, industrial and manufacturing, life sciences, maritime, media and culture, real estate, retail, and smart cities. Or under the page, uh, the lead page, City of Opportunity, it says, our, our economic st strength spans all industries, including professional business services, healthcare, government, retail, finance, education, construction, transportation, real estate, publishing, music, fashion, advertising, and film. Now, those are just pages on a website, but I think that sort of speaks to how this, the role of tourism economy is not central. Just think about the mayor's signature jobs plan, New York Works, and says, these are the fast growing, high paying industries that represent the future of our city. But as you pointed out, there's literally only a few sentences about the industry that actually created more jobs in finance, manufacturing, and technology, and is one of the fastest growing. And so the, the notion that, that EDC's role is kind of peripheral. I think that I worked at EDC in the 90s. I think that it's evolved in response to changing economic priorities and needs in the city. 
And EDC does amazing work. The work they've done on 42nd Street created one of the great, you know, tourism destinations of our time. But I think that it's 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 important that it be more front and center. So that's why we support the idea of a of a dashboard that that is part of the city's economic development and uh, job creation agencies. And we also think that if that's front and center, then it won't just take Alex Baldwin complaining to get a problem that is far less complicated than fixing New York's uh, airports, you know, which is a consumer affairs thing. The next day, the mayor got a bunch of agencies in a, in a room and said, solve this problem about people getting ripped off by the Statue of Liberty ferries. That's not a complicated thing. It's a matter of, of will that grows out of an understanding that this is a main tourism and job. Tourism is a main jobs driver. One or two other things. Um, uh, we thank the city and the council for, for filling gap. We, we don't think that uh, NYC and company should ever be subject to that, ga that peg uh, cuts. This is an agency that produces, through its efforts, produces amazing uh, results for the city, and it needs more investment, not less. You've heard the comparisons with other cities. The key there is that the, the, not, is that the taxes that are collected by hotels is guaranteed in some form, some portion of that, to go back to the city. In, in uh, Las Vegas, it's 78% of their hotel taxes. Um, uh, and in San Francisco, 57% of those hotel taxes, taxes automatically go back to fund tourism promotion. And to be more specific, between 2008 and 2018, hotel tax revenues in New York City grew by 87% from $1.3 billion to $2.4 billion. So over a billion dollar growth in taxes for New York City during the, and 87% and growth. During that time, the city's contribution to NYC and company grew by only 7% from $20 million to $21.5 million. Again, there have been some valuable increases in recent years, both because of the city hall and the council. So that's great. But if we look at it over time, we're way behind and need to catch up. Thank you. No, we agree, Tim, and I think looking at all aspects of revenue generators for the tourism industry, whether it's future EDC projects, mm -hmm. having it built in mm -hmm. to a calculator, whether it's a tourism mm -hmm. uh, bids calculation through the hotel industry, uh, and specifically the budget that hasn't moved in over a decade, mm -hmm. there would be real simple ways to enhance New York and company's role, but also provide that degree of security we need here in the city to continue to compete. Because mm. if we ever lose that competitive edge, it'd be real hard to get it back. Mm. Um, so we're gonna continue to fight for the for the dashboard, specifically with this legislation. So it seems like we're across the board and mm. support just mm. kind of a little hazy on where it's gonna be and how it's gonna be rolled out. But um, I think all of this will be part, the, the data, mm. the job data I think mm. is important, the out of borough inclusion is important and interagency coordination to assist I think with New York and company and EDC's vision is, is where we're going. Yeah and that you know that idea of just the other agencies supporting NYC and company's mission I mean NYC and company does an amazing job they they shouldn't have to worry about toilets or how to have better signage and and bus routes that are going to Peter Coos district which should you know should be a major tourism attraction and the tourism ready program is making that happen so as long as there's something that, that helps to energize the other agencies to respond to the needs of the tourism economy um, and that empowers NYC to sort of say, hey, we know what needs to be done. Uh, here's a direction for, for how to get the other folks to the table. One of those ideas would be to have the annual meeting of the city agencies respond to this office and New York and company to hear their direct concerns with every city agency present at that annual yeah. meeting. And that would be one of the reasons. So thank you to this panel. Uh, I think we have one more panel? Yeah, one more panel. One more panel. Oh, Councilmember Barrett, thank you for coming. Thank you. If you have any questions you want to jump in. Okay. Uh, so we have Alexander Silversmith from the Alliance for Coney Island and Charles Nolan from the Big Bus Tours of New York. Those are our last two speakers. And I don't know if any of the students wanted to sign up or give a couple words before we close out. If not, always happy to have you here in New York City. So good morning. 
Um, so good morning, and thank you again for having me. I was at the, the committee hearing last year, um, which was in a much nicer space. It was. But, it was. You know, it was very nice to experience My wife it. reminded me all the time. What happened? Like, oh, we gotta get um, so I'm the executive director of the Alliance for Coney Island, and we, continue, we seek to continue the revitalization of Coney Island and increase visitorship. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak about that. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out, and I'm going to sort of skip through a lot of my testimony, but um, is that, you know, Coney Island, one of the things that I, I hear time and again, and I mentioned this last year at the committee hearing, is it's a cornerstone of Coney Island, of Brooklyn, and of New York City's economy. Um, and we're at a crucial moment where there's been a lot of investment done in the city, by the city, in Coney Island, almost a billion dollars in creating the aquarium and the amphitheater, um, but there's really not marketing support for this destination. Um, so one of the things that we were in support of the creation of this agency or or committee or whatever it sort of form it takes, um, but we think that it really needs to focus on outer borough strategies on how agencies can collaborate. Um, one of the other big sort of issues that we see is in Coney Island, unlike probably most destinations in New York, there are so many different agencies that have jurisdiction. Um, so we have parks, we have DOT, we have EDC managing some of the leases. There's just a lot of agency coordination that is needed that we try to put together. Um, but I think somebody who is really pushing forward the vision of, of tourism and really driving that force for the area and connecting all these agencies would be extremely helpful. Um, and then the last piece is, a lot of our work focuses on free events. Um, and so one of the things that I would propose is that if this office were created <laughs> is that it focus on the bureaucracy of free events and the permitting and um, the fees that are involved. So there's a high high uh, cost to doing free events, which I think is a shame. Um, that is one of the drivers in Coney Island to get people down there. And even for the Mermaid Parade, they're paying a lot of money just to produce that event. I'm sure for Pride, it's the same thing. Um, so. Uh, I appreciate this again, and I I hope that, that if an office is created, it supports this driving driving tourism and really figuring out how to ma navigate bureaucracy to make things easier for nonprofits and for the areas to thrive. So thank you again. Oh, Alexandra, I, I agree. I think those are great points on out of borough coordination. The yeah. event planning is is a full time job in it, it itself. Is. And when I do my fireworks show in Ju uh, for, in Fourth of July out in Fort Totten. Mm -hmm. That's six months of planning of an entire office, and a lot of folks can't really dedicate yeah. that time. So I think those are great ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Council member, <clears throat> good morning. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, testify this morning. My name is Charles Nolan, general manager for Big Bus Tours New York. I've been working in tourism for over 10 years now, and specifically in New York since the creation of our company in 2014. Mm -hmm. Big Bus Tours is the lar largest sightseeing op bus operator in the world, serving over 6 million visitors each year across 23 cities and four continents. Locally, we employ nearly 500 people. Most of them are members of TW Local 100. In all our cities, the company's target remain the same, being the number one thing to do in every world-famous city while maintaining full compliance and excellent status with the agencies governing our industry. No matter what the city regulations or priori priorities are, I define our company as a citizen and our of a beautiful city, and our team members are its proud ambassadors. Because of the size of the group operating in 23 cities, Big Bus Tours has a relationship with 23 different city halls, CVBs, tourism and transportation agencies of each city in which we operate. We are accustomed to the scrutiny of our operation and the economic impact of our business model um, that our business model brings to the great city we work in. Each year, our company introduces with expertise and passion the intrigue and splendor that, are, that is New York City to over 800,000 visitors. Each one of them averages three hop off and back on the bus during the validity of his or her ticket, representing nearly 2.5 million individual rides withdrawn from our very limited street equity in Manhattan. By using and operating efficiently the most eff effective and tourist-friendly mass transit of double-decker buses, Visitors hopping off my buses are directly spending into our city, attractions, museums, restaurants, Broadway show, etc. Big Bus Tours fully support 
the introduction of the, and the creation of the Office of Interagency Tourism Affairs, and thanks the Council member for this effort. We are uh, concerned by the lack of a consistent deliverable of what we believe to be a huge importance in the interagency issue in New York sightseeing market, which is the vending and the, t uh, the vending and the ticket selling through DCA licenses on DOT regulated plaza, sidewalk, buses, and stops. It is our opinion that the two agencies need a common voice through this office creation in order to solve one of the most visible and negative issues impacting tourism and citizens alike and the reputation of our city. We urge, we urge the office to assess the negative impact of human street vendors' barricades, reported harassment, and deceptive tactic overcrowding of sidewalks and metro entrances. We understand that Council Member Espinal, as chair of the Committee of Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, and the Council Member Powers are working on legislation that will establish a code of conduct similar to one that exists in London and several other places in the world. We support such code that will clearly define the standard of operation, behavior, and presentation for the allocation of on-street staff. We hope that you will tell them you want to be part of that effort. Big Busters is also looking forward to be including in the discussion and researches around the five-year tourism sustainability plan and help in any way possible. We thank you very much. Thank you, Charles, for your input. We like to have all the partners here. I'm glad to see you're supporting the code of conduct. We'll pass that on to the other council members. And Alexander, thank you for coming in. Both, both panels in two years in a row. Uh, with that, it brings really a, to a close today's focus on creating this Office of Interagency uh, Coordination, focusing on tourism and tourism concerns and how we can assist New York and Company and EDC to create that uh, and better coordinate the issues facing the tourism industry. I'd like to thank my amazing staff with Alex, Emily, and Aaliyah. I said they should have their own TV show with that name. Uh, and my chief of staff, Jonathan Shutt, and my, uh, my now um, assistant chief and also legislative, reassuming legislative affairs, Ahmed Nazar, to making today happen and every day. So thank you with that. We close our committee's hearing. <laughs>